Welcome to Musical Orbit. We're here today at the Punch Bowl in Mayfair with the fantastic electric string quartet, String Fever. Giles and Ralph Broadbent are violinists, their brother Neil plays the cello, and their cousin Graham plays the viola. You grew up in remarkably musical surroundings. How much were you guided by your parents in your musical education? How much of it was already in you and you would, would have done it anyway without their help? Well, I think uh, we were fortunate, if that's the right word, to be surrounded by music when we were growing up, all four of us, um, in particular classical music, in particular string playing. So three of the previous generation in our family decided to make string playing their profession. And uh, so quite literally we're surrounded by string playing. And I think one of the benefits of that from our point of view is we had that uh, wealth of experience to, to draw from. Uh, when we got perhaps a bit older and we decided we wanted to make music our career. I mean, when we're very young, it was, yeah, I want to get involved with that because that looks a lot of fun. And you see it from that perspective, as, you know, starting to learn the instrument. But I think it really had its benefits when we got a little bit older and we all decided we wanted to become professional performers. And just to have that wealth of knowledge, it, it never really felt like it was being forced on you by, by the uncles or dads um, at the time. But you kind of knew that you had good advice if you just wanted to know what the music business was like. Um, because I think it's very uh, difficult to get that unless you actually speak to people that have been through that experience of doing it. You, they don't really teach you that at music college, sadly. They teach you how to play scales, or they try to teach you how to play scales, but the, what you might call the real world of a performing musician is uh, it's something that you really only get from speaking to other people. We were lucky that we had that on hand, uh, particularly our Uncle Nigel, who's in the London Symphony Orchestra. So he was, uh, we, we used to go and follow him um, for work experience, for example, you know, some people would go into an office for a week and we thought, oh, we want to be uh, musicians. Certainly, I don't know about Graham, but certainly Giles and I went and followed, it shadowed him, if you like, for a week. So watched all the rehearsals, the recording <coughs> sessions. Not only watched it, but then we were able to speak to both him and all his colleagues. So we had that access, if you like, at quite a young age to, to uh, professional performing musicians. So, even uh, younger than that, from a very early age, or perhaps even before you were born, I don't know, your dad was running music courses from your family home in West Wales, which I came on as a child, had a great time, it was absolutely <laughs> brilliant. So you must have loved the social aspect of it. When I was, um, uh, they started the courses when I was two years old and Ralph was uh, zero, so about six weeks old I think when uh, my dad ran his first music course. But it started out, it was his um, pupils from rugby school and his private pupils in the town of rugby, brought them over to play chamber music and string orchestra music. And also as well to give them the uh, the chance to sort of mix socially, play a bit of sports, go to the beach, all those kind of things. So as well as being a, a music camp environment, it was about teaching kids or giving kids the the, uh, the chance to, to socialise and see the social side of music. I think uh, what a lot of people who aren't musicians don't realise is... Um, it's, it's a way of life being a musician. It's not just get your music uh, instrument out of the box and then put it back in its box. It's all about the camaraderie. That's, yeah. in a way, how the, the best orchestras and the best ensembles are groups that, that actually get on socially. Sadly, not every orchestra <laughs> gets on quite that way, but you, I think as musicians we can tell that really class music performance it usually comes from a group of musicians that get on well together. Yeah. I think my dad was uh, trying to encourage kids to have that opportunity to mix and play music together, but also socialise together. And so now, how does it work with the four of you working together? Well, this, well it certainly sort of transcends down to myself. I'm, I'm quite a bit younger than these old guys, as you can probably <laughs> tell. But, um, and my younger sister, who's also a musician, and I remember growing up, um, uh, when we were growing up at that stage, my dad had, with the help of my mum, had run so many of these music courses by then. Not only had I seen that, but I'd seen the social aspect from looking up to my older brothers, of course, I wanted to play with them. I grew up listening to their CDs that they recorded in their little busking groups and stuff, and I always listened to it every day, and I wanted to be a part of that. So to be able to, to join in was fantastic, but to see the social aspect of it was, it was really inspiring. You did actually used to not quite understand why you couldn't come to yeah, the I could, yeah, there's, I think there's when you were six and yeah. we were we were eighteen and nineteen. You go, oh, I want to go to the pub. Neil. You can't come to the pub. You are six. You <laughs> actually just you know, went in the mood and yeah, couldn't understand why. Just a couple more years to wait for that. Yeah, to yeah. wait till he was a teenager before really joining the band properly. But no, it's funny. People often ask us, um, having a musical family around us, were we forced into it? How much of it was natu natural nature nurture, if you want to use that expression? But um, as as Giles just mentioned, I think that, that social interaction 
it's important for people to learn about that and they're playing instruments. I think anyone who plays an instrument has got to a certain level maybe has that choice, do I turn it into my profession or not? And I think one of the things to, to remember if you're at that stage is it doesn't really matter if it's your profession. Um, it's not necessarily that lucrative and a lot of particularly parents will want their kids to go into a stable economic job. Um, but you, the, the, as Jars just mentioned, the social spin-offs of learning an instrument, even if you know, it's not your profession, but just getting to a competent level, that interaction with other musicians, um, I think is, is invaluable. So therefore to have some skills um, taught to you, and, and you know, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're gonna, it's gonna, not gonna be wasted, it's not gonna be wasted time. I've met so many people on the road, on the tra on traveling, and you meet businessmen who, after they've seen us perform and, and show, they, they get excited by it, and they go, you know, I wish I'd kept the guitar when I was 16, you know, whatever it was, instrument it was, because they kind of see us having fun on stage, and they compare that perhaps to their office job. Um, the fact they're probably earning 10 times our salary is uh, not relevant at that point, but um, but I think the cliche is true, you know, the, if, even if you've kept it up as a, if you want to say, as an amateur role, I think that's something to always remember. Uh, it, it's not uh, it's not a bad thing, even if you never turn it into a career. So. Yeah, I can, I can definitely remember, I can relate to that in that when I was... When I was younger, and I started ch playing the cello. I was about six, five or six, and I can honestly say that I hated practicing. I didn't want to be in the room. I enjoyed it. You know, I was very fortunate having my dad there as a teacher every day, playing through, accompanying with, you know, accompanying me and playing through, through pieces with Jazz and Ralph when they were at home, and that was good fun. So uh, at that stage, I realised that I liked the group playing and you know, ensemble playing a lot more than playing on my own or practicing stuff. But it was also in to me, it's important to remember that you have. There's no shortcuts. You have to be able to. You have to do the hard work. You have to do the practice. Get the technique right, and you know know what you're doing before you can then really enjoy. You, can, you know, everyone wants to take a shortcut. Yeah, and some of us <laughs> got better at shortcuts than others <laughs> after a while. But um, but think, yeah, yeah, definitely. You have to really, you really do the hard work, do the practice, so you can really enjoy the the, the downtime a lot more. That or you know. I think one of the things that I think all four of us have wanted to do with our musical careers is, is do something slightly different. Okay, we had this background of classical string playing, if you like, and how do you really put your own individual stamp on that? I think one of the, the stages of the journey we've been on was when we were sort of, I guess, teenage years, we started doing a lot of busking. Obviously, we get a bit of pocket money, whatever. And uh, when we were a little bit older, we borrowed our parents' camper van that they had already in the family and we went over to Europe and just toured around playing in the streets there. I think when you're doing that, when you're playing in the street, you really, you learn how to be a bit different because if you're, if you're from the very sort of what you might call the old school classical way of performing, I think a lot of people aren't going to relate to that and they're not going to give you any money. So, and it's, you know, so we, we found ways of opening it up to literally the man in the streets and I think that has really kind of unspoken thing that we've all tried to do with the group is try so the man in the street can relate to it you know if you like taking the, or the snobbery woman the, or the woman in the street yes the, which yeah, was probably the individual. a little bit more what we were looking for in those days yeah. when we were when this, we were busking it was the women in the street that we were more interested yes, in impressing right. to be honest but it's uh, you know so I think that's it was a fiend public yeah. <laughs> it was a fiend public <laughs> So you went, you went to the music college, you went down that conventional route yeah. enjoying your busking on holidays but at what point did you think no, I'm not going to go down that conventional symphony orchestra route or whatever you well, made I, thought of. I guess the point we, we sort of made a decision, it was kind of a gradual thing, I suppose. From, from a young age, we, when we were doing the busking, I think, Giles and I, a little bit older, we kind of had this urge to run our own group, but we never quite had the personnel at the right time. And when we were, we were working in the West End along with Graham, playing on several West End shows, so we kind of, our time was focused on that. And then suddenly... About, uh, about 2003, 2004, about that. Neil there was, uh, he was on a gap year, as it's called, before going to college. And it turned out to be, we kidnapped him basically. Gap never, lifetime. Gap never decade, made it. Yeah. So suddenly we had the lineup. We'd, we'd done some busking before. We'd, we'd already owned some electric violins and we'd been playing around with it more as a kind of hobby than a profession. So it kind of, that was a catalyst. And then we met someone that said, can you put together a show? So that gave us a focus to do that. So I guess all these little gradual stages suddenly came together very quickly at that time and gave us a real focus. You know, the, the, the experience we'd had with busking and playing to the, uh, the layman or woman in the street. And uh, I guess that was the real catalyst for what we're doing now. So I think a gradual thing, but that was the moment where it really accelerated. And when did you become electric? 
when did we well uh, again that sort of gradual thing the first electric violin it's we ever wind bought. up before isn't it <laughs> well yeah I saw the I very know. first six string electric violin I'd, I'd always wanted an electric violin from the age of about 13, 14 I saw a guy on television playing electric violin um, and you couldn't go and buy one in Argos they were, uh, you, I, I just I had no idea where you got an electric violin from but I always hankered after having one you tour a lot, that must be trying on the very best of friendships. How do you make it work? <laughs> no, I mean, it's, it's not all beer and skittles, apart from when we're bowling on a cruise ship drinking beer. But, um, no, I mean, we're in each other's pockets a lot of the time. So, Which particularly when we're touring right? in the States a lot, uh, we're constantly on the road or we're in a different hotel every night, and you can tend to get quite short with each other. Sorry, no pun intended, Ralph. But, um, but the thing is that, uh, you know, being a family, you can, tell, you can be a lot more honest with each other. Sometimes a bit too honest, but, you know, you have an argument, you call each other whatever profanity you might. The likelihood is, I am a, and he is a, mm. But the next day you move on a lot quicker, you get over it. You get over it, you know, you get over it. You get over it a lot quicker, you, know, you can be a lot, you can be more honest. I think a lot of bands or, uh, you know, I can imagine stories where, situations where a lot of, the negative feelings and you get sort of stored up and then people snap and then it goes wrong and then you know bands disband and then they don't go any further. Well I think the thing is you know with close family as with close friends but particularly family you speak your mind more is that always a good thing I don't know yes it is in the long term definitely but I guess it's that less less diplomacy but um it's and me. you get that with I reckon there's, you get that with any there's group. two, th there's two yeah. things there's two things at play here there's a group a quartet could be a rock band or a string quartet, whatever you're in, a group of four players who are all, who've got musical ideas and want to be a, um, and performers and all that kind of stuff. And then you've got four family members. Now, I, I, most people I meet say, how can you work with your family? We generally get on quite well. Anyway, even when we're not playing, we, we would go skiing together or go on holiday together. We still, you know, before we were a group, we would hang out together and we're kind of mates. Um, so we've got that sort of that double pressure of being with your family and in your group. It does manage to work, as, as Neil and Ralph said, I think we, we get stuff off our chest. I think um, the, the most, we do, we have bust ups, we have punch ups, we physically smash each other up. The last, I think the last uh, one. But the funny enough, no one picks we, on Graham. I don't know. Because he's <laughs> twice <laughs> our side. Graham is the gentle giant. Don't I'm, 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 Graham never I've gets stopped the fights. Graham never gets involved fight in the fights. It's the three he's, he's soft. He's easy to wind up. I he's easiest fight. to wind up. He's the hardest to wind up. When you do wind him up, it's epic because he's a terrier. <laughs> <laughs> he's either all or nothing. Like. He's either giving it out and knowing he's being a cheeky little person. Okay, so I didn't go to music college like these guys went to. So I sort of got to learn on the job, which is which is good in a way because you get to see the pros and cons of it in a real term situation. But like also, I mean, I can learn everything from them, from also my uncles that taught at the academies for a little bit and stuff, you know, so I can hear the practical lessons. But then, then you can blame put it, it on into us. practice. Exactly, that's what I was going to say. That's, that's the thing, we catch each other's thoughts a lot as well. We'll finish each other's sentences. Um, and what yeah, about, it's, what it's about division fault. of labour when you're on tour? Um, labour, what's that? So yeah, that's exactly. what's that? What is that? Division of laziness. <laughs> oh, right, right. It's actually not laziness, it's actually just Lace, optimum. Lazy. Lazy. Sort of, if you think about it, it's just very clever because what you're doing is you're, you're dividing other, other the time. Yeah. yeah. Time economy, optimum. time and effort economy. Oh, yeah. I think there's Neil's speciality. He's concise with his uh, Who's tour manager books. then? Ralph, well, I you? think uh, Giles is really generally the, he's certainly the driving force behind the group and therefore takes on a lot of responsibility. It's funny, in the early years, I think it, our kind of roles, if you want to use that, within the more practical side weren't clearly defined. And we met some of our German friends. Uh, Giles and I used to work in Germany and they were very, well, surely you must divide the jobs up equally and this is very normal. <laughs> but we didn't quite have that um, organisational naturally, but I think over the years it's it kind of has settled down into people having roles. Grails, Graham is very, very good practically building stuff. And with the, all the electronic kit that we have to carry around that's flying everywhere, there's a certain amount of cables and practical things that need kind of modifying, if you like. You can't just buy these things off the shelf. So that's one thing that Graham's very good at. And when we get a new van, he kits it all out with, uh, you know, the, the things that's needed within the van, the tour bus. So that's, that's one of his offstage skills, if you like. Um, Giles is quite um, into all the tech side of it, so he'll be looking at what's the next best sort of amplifier effects unit we can do. Um, I tend to do all the most of the musical arranging, so I've, I'm the one charged with, if someone says, can you put together a medley of such, such and such, I, that's kind of one of my roles. Neil looks beautiful. Uh, Neil's the, uh, off stage, he just, you know. Banter, I drive people around. <laughs> 
they drive them around. <laughs> Yeah. But also, you're the <laughs> beatboxer, you're the yeah. rhythm section yeah, as well. Yeah, yeah. Well, he's actually also one of these guys, he's, he's, I would think, probably the most stylishly dressed. So, he unofficial wardrobe thing. At first, it took us a while to think he was just ridiculing us for our oh, dress it sense. It, it, yeah, a tough job, he would say, but I think he's uh, unofficially going I like to, to I like to observe the delegation of the job as well, just to check that everyone else is working you're, you're correctly, chief. efficiently. You know, I like to diffuse situations if they're, or, or you know, in, ignite a little bit of fun into situations if they're boring. I tend to do quite a lot of the driving on tours. You know, say for example, we do thousands of miles in you know for the space of a few weeks, just because they're simply rubbish at driving. <laughs> you know, I'm Fair not enough. saying that I'm good. But I just am good. <laughs> <laughs> he's sort of David Brent, but he's sort of that one degree cockier. What David Brent makes Jeremy Clarkson. Yeah. Yeah. What speed do you drive? Yeah. Uh, Seventy tops. Okay. And then you slow down, pull over, answer the phone. Yeah. So when you start a piece, somebody asks you to do a particular medley, say. Yeah. Ralph, you sit down and you write it, and then what happens? Yeah, people often ask, how do you put the material together? Um, I kind of do, I would say, 80%, 90% of the groundwork. So, for example, we do quite a few medleys. So I'll, I'll start that process. I'll, I'll sit down with a big, long list of, uh, say, for example, it was, uh, we recently did an opera medley, so all the famous operas. And then you, I'll just sort of try and work out which ones slot together, trying to do some stuff in the original keys that doesn't work, and, and so it's, it's a bit of a, um, and a jigsaw puzzle, slotting things around. And then when that's all done, I'll bring it to the group. <coughs> it really kind of gets knocked into shape then in terms, of, I guess, more the orchestration of it. It's like, well, let's put that down the octave, we'll cut a couple of bars off there. So it's, it's never brought to the table as a finished article by me, but I'll do the, the lion's share of it. I, that's one of the things I do, and then... And then we'll all we'll all chip in with how we want to finish. Usually, it. At the same, <laughs> usually at the same time as each other while we're all talking, and our own idea is definitely the best. Yeah, uh, well, so there were, we'll talk about it, discuss various different ideas. Agree, and then then I'm right. right. Yeah, exactly. Usually, <laughs> and agree. In my that's what's to finish my yeah. joke <laughs> yeah. every in, time. In my humble but correct opinion. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But I think it's it's been nice over the years that we have been together. We have found more of a rhythm on that. Can you imagine four people that are siblings and very close relatives, all wanting their idea to be heard? <laughs> it's like okay, you go. You it's will be. It's funny to watch. It's funny to watch them all just try. And, uh, but I think the other thing, talk someone about these different options and then just come up with my idea. But someone pointed out sometimes. <laughs> is, but I actually like, like I said, it's not lazy. It's observing. It's watching them all just do, <laughs> thinking that they're doing stuff. Just yeah. let them do it. You know puppet I mean? master. It's you. a bit like shopping with your wife, isn't it? You, know, <laughs> you see what is obviously the right thing, and then you go around five more shops, and then you go back and buy the thing you wanted in the first place. Right. Yeah. I couldn't possibly <laughs> comment. You definitely agree that my idea was. So my basically, idea. Raph, Raph does the arrangements, and we fine tune them, but they'll end up being my idea. Yeah. So, can you show us how these amazing instruments work? So, this is uh, what it sounds like as an electric guitar. <laughs> Here we have a bit of a Hammond organ sound. We've got a wah-wah sound. So I've had uh, great fun over the last few years trying to uh, work out how to make these sounds from uh, an electric violin. They're the hardest thing was actually to make an electric violin sound like a regular violin. It's very, very easy to make an electric violin sound like nothing on earth and quite horrible. If you speak to any sound engineers, I think you'll find uh, um, they dread having electric violins on a gig. And we met one sound engineer recently and he couldn't, he showed me all the EQ that he uses just on a, a regular electric violin. We came in, plugged us in, and he couldn't quite work out how we got it sounding so nice. And it's probably about five or ten years fiddling around with our guitar effects processor, just tweaking it to get it to sound like a real violin. So do you play it differently from a normal acoustic violin then, the actual bow pressure? Um, the technique used to play an electric violin is pretty much the same as a regular violin. Maybe don't press quite as hard, you know, I quite like to dig into an acoustic violin and make a good old hacky sound, that's my style, the gypsy style. Uh, on an electric violin, if you press too hard, you do get a sort of crunchy sound, but um, basically it's the same technique. 
So what makes string fever different from other electric string quartets? Well, I think we are probably the only group that I know of anyway that um, really fully utilise the electric violin as an instrument, making lots of different sounds with the guitar effects process and all that kind of stuff. Um, a lot of groups that play the electric violin tend to use it, in my opinion, just as more of as a prop or as a window dressing. They look great, um, they look colourful, they look modern. Uh, but we really try and explore the sounds they can make. There's not many uh, uh, groups out there that actually get the full depth of sounds out of them. There was an amazing number that you did recently in a, a gig that I came to, uh, Albanelli's Adagio. Um, I wonder if you could just talk me through how you made that incredible organ sound. It was really actually, it sounded just like an organ. Bizarre. Well, we've got, a, we've got a, an effects processor called uh, a POG, which stands for Polyphonic Octave Generator, and it basically takes the sound you're making uh, and you can play it at the same octave, one octave up, two octaves up, one octave down and two octaves down. So you've got five different versions of the note you're playing, and then you can mix it so you have a different, uh, you know, different uh, volumes of each of those. You can have just the low ones, just the high ones, or all five. Uh, so for the organ sound, we get all five of those, and it sounds like an organ playing on lots of different pipes. Here we go, shall I demonstrate that for you? 